Who's ready for some fun? <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> You're ready to go and attack that cake again. I had fun eating that cake. Amazing. Okay, you guys, I gotta tell you, this is uh this is gonna be a very fun and special show for me. And I know all the drummer shows are good and I love all those, but this one is exceptionally cool because it's a part of the business that I don't know a lot a lot about. I mean I understand it and you know, but but there are questions, things relative to what I do on the road that I want to talk about with Jackie. And, you know, I can say anything I want in the world about this guy, but he's he's a Long Island, a New York legend. He's um, a very funny guy. And somehow, and we're going to, I'll ask him about that, he keeps, remains funny. So um, <laughs> I'm going to... Uh, I uh, just just check this out, and it's a you know listen, I, um, it's a little off color, so if you have you know your children involved, you might wanna whatever, and um, Jackie, one thing was never known for being PC, but I thought this was a rather um, corralled performance, <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you enjoy it. I laughed out loud watching this this afternoon. Uh, yeah, he's th funny. This is my old friend, Jackie the Joke Man Marling, doing what he does best. And uh, I'm going to turn my mic off or you'll hear me laughing because this shit's just too funny. So it is my honor to bring to you the comedy stylings of Jackie Martling. Yeah. show, huh? Oh, Flanagan and Rebellion Stokowski are all going for the same job, and the guy that's interviewing him has got no ears. Well, Flanagan goes in first. The guy says, my friend, the job you're applying for requires the powers of observation. Make an observation about me. Well, Flanagan says, how much you've got no ears? He says, get out! Rebellion goes in. He says, my friend, the job you're applying for requires the powers of observation. Make an observation about me. He says, ha, ah, that's easy, boss. You got no ears. He says, get out. <laughs> Belly goes out in the lobby. He says to Stokowski, hey, listen, the guy doing the interview has got no ears. A little bit sensitive about it. Whatever you do, don't bring it up. Stokowski's like, die. Because <laughs> my friend, the job you're applying for requires the powers of observation. Make an observation about me. Stokowski says, you wear contacts. It's terrific observation. You're absolutely right. How can you tell us? How could you wear glasses? You got no fucking ears. <laughs> Gotta get a big fat wife. Gotta get a big fat wife. She gets out of the shower, sits on the toilet, and gets stuck. He calls the plumber and he realizes she's sitting there naked. He can't have that, so he takes his bowler derby and puts it on her lap to cover up home base, okay? The plumber shows up and takes a look. He says, well, pal, I think I can save your wife, but the guy in the hat's a goner. <laughs> Guy's on an airplane. The airplane's taking off. He looks across the aisle. There's a lady breastfeeding her baby. A couple hours later, they come in for a landing. She's breastfeeding the kid again. He says, excuse me, ma'am, I couldn't help but notice you were breastfeeding your baby on takeoff, and now you're breastfeeding him on landing. Is there a reason? She says, yes. I breastfeed my baby on takeoff and landing so his ears won't pop. <laughs> the guy says, fuck, in all these years I've been chewing gum. <laughs> FedEx guy knocks on the door. FedEx guy knocks on the door. Door opens a little kid. He's naked except for his underpants. He's smoking a joint. In the other hand, he's got a half full bottle of Jack Daniels. The FedEx guy says, kid, is your mother home? He says, what do you think? <laughs> guy sitting all alone on a 
a Sunday morning. There's a knock on the door. He is. The guy's sitting there says, hello. I'm a Jehovah's Witness, and I have stories to tell you. The guy says, well, come on in. Brings him in, sits in the living room. Let me get you a cup of coffee. Gets a cup of coffee. He's a Jehovah's Witness. Just says, his... Now, one of these stories you had to tell me. Jehovah's Witness says, how the fuck should I know? I never got this far before. <laughs> job interview. Guy goes for a job interview. The interviewer says, what do you think is your biggest fault? The guy says, I think my biggest fault is my honesty. The interviewer says, I don't think honesty is a fault. The guy says, I don't give a fuck what you think. <laughs> the guy goes walking up to the doctor's office. A nun comes running out. Ah! He says, doc, what's with the nun? He says, I just told her she's pregnant. He said, the nun's pregnant? He says, no, but it sure cured her hiccups. <laughs> <laughs> so why do Jewish guys watch porn movies backwards? They like the part where the hooker gives the money back. <laughs> Chinese couple. Chinese couple's in bed. The husband says, I want a 69. His wife says, why do you want beef and broccoli now? <laughs> Fuck you, that's a beauty, man. You guys are great. I don't like him. Don't get me laughing, we'll be here all night. Polish family sitting in the living room. The wife turns to her husband and says, let's send the kids out back to P-L-A-Y so we can fuck. <laughs> How could you not laugh at that? <laughs> Two flies land on a piece of shit. I've been telling jokes for 40 years. That is the single best introduction to a dirty joke. <laughs> Two flies land on a piece of shit. How can you go wrong? Let's watch. Two flies land on a piece of shit. The first one lifts his leg and pfft. The second one says, come on, man, I'm trying to eat. <laughs> Guy says to a girl, give me a blowjob. She says, be more romantic. He says, give me a blowjob in the rain. <laughs> oh, we haven't found a what? Little old lady walks in the sex shop. She says, where are all the dildos? She says, they're on the wall, lady. She says, I'll take a red one. She says, no, lady. The dildos are on the wall next to the fire extinguisher. <laughs> on the intercom. Not yet. Pilot comes on the intercom. Thank you for flying West Eastern. We expect to touch down in Los Angeles in approximately six hours. And we appreciate your business. He forgets to turn off the intercom. He turns to the co-pilot. He says, you know what? I think I'm going to go take a shit and then get a blowjob from that hot new blonde stewardess. She's in the back of the plane, realizes the intercom's still on. She goes running up the aisle. A little old lady says, take your time, honey. He said he was going to take a shit first. <laughs> a couple goes to a marriage counselor. 
goes to the marriage counselor. The marriage counselor says, I think we should begin with something you have in common. The husband says, neither of us likes to suck cock. <laughs> that joke is worth the price of admission. Ticket. It gets to be his turn. And the girl selling the tickets has an incredible set of jugs. Just give me two tickets to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Turns the guy behind him says, I can't believe I said that. What an idiot I am. And the guy says, Relax. You said the wrong thing by accident. It's called a Freudian slip. It happens. You know what happened to me just the other day? Yeah. I was sitting at the breakfast table with my wife, and I meant to say, Please pass the salt. And by accident, I said, You fucking cunt! You wrecked my life! <laughs> You guys are fantastic. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm telling uh, you. One's funnier than I, the next. I'm laughing out loud, bro. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely laughing out loud. <laughs> wow. Are you funny? Oh, you are funny. Well, you've always been funny. Have you always been funny? I don't know, but I'll tell you, it's a little embarrassing because I'm sitting here all alone in my garage and I've been telling, I've been telling most of those jokes since 1958 and I'm sitting here pissing in my pants, laughing at <laughs> It's, I, I'll tell you what, they were, they were perfect because I'm uh, just, just really funny. And um, it's interesting because, you know, when I decided to do this show, everybody's out there playing Margaritaville. Nobody wants to hear me do that or bang on drums or whatever. And I decided this would be a great way for me to catch up with old friends in the business that I might run into casually if we were both doing the same show somewhere here or there or whatever. And um, the fun part about the whole thing is that I really get to see my friends I, I i mean when was the last time you and i were in the same room together do you remember? i have no idea except i do know if you're on the same show together it's like hey how you doing i hope everything's going great yeah everything's been great that's as deep as it ever gets if you happen to cross paths i don't know i wore this shirt oh this yes we on this together yes, yes. absolutely yeah. yes at the uh at the hilton in atlantic city yeah when, 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 uh, when, who was it? Jack Bruce wanted to get in a fight with, uh, with, what's his name? Mark Farner. Every, oh. I'm sure you remember every show. I didn't host all, but I hosted some of them. But every show, Mark Farner's rap about America and we love you. And it got a little bit longer, a little bit longer until it finally got to where it was such a soliloquy. And I remember we were on stage uh, at the Hilton in Atlantic City, and he was halfway through his soliloquy, and Jack Bruce just walked to him and said, shut up and sing your fucking song. And <laughs> people first got into it. And I'll never forget, because I tell people the next night, just like, just like seventh graders on the bus, they had to stand in opposite wings with people on the show. So they'd be separated like children. <laughs> I, that was so great. Well, I'll tell you funny. <laughs> tell you hey, funny. by the way, the guy who books that, that, those tours, we used Toby Ludwig. Uh, I talked to him all the time. And he told me to tell you hello. I don't know if you remember Toby. Oh, I certainly guy. do. I even remember his phone number, man, because it was like <laughs> it's the only fo it's the only cell phone number quite cooler than mine. If you know his number, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I certainly <laughs> remember Toby, and please give him my absolute best. I hope yeah. he's doing well. He's, he's killing, you know, he's doing great. Good, good, good. So, man, I, and I, <laughs> I can't tell you uh, how much respect I have for stand-up, just in general. And I have, the I have some... timing is the, yeah, so good. Yeah, if you don't have man, the timing, the it's, timing, you know, if you don't have, but, wow. but that goes without saying. But just the other stuff, like, uh, I don't know, you know, being a musician, the way you work the mic when the, when the guy screams, get that, you get out of the office, the way you... You know what I mean? So that you can do the full... The dynamics it, of it, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's brilliant, and it's stagecraft, and I admire it, and uh, and it's nice to see it. And I wonder how you much... You know, it's, it's already nice to hear that, but I'll tell you, so many people 
that have great respect for comics or or some other field of the business that they don't directly do, a lot of times it comes from an incident. Do you know a guitar player named Arlen Roth? Sure. Well, Arlen told me, he, I used to work at the workshop recording studios. I was like the, the, the janitor, the studio manager in the 70s. Hey, Bob. And uh, do you know the place? It was sure. it, great, great. But Kevin Kelly and Jeff Cracky. And, uh, and I was working there. And Arlen Roth came in because he used to come in and play guitar and stuff because he had been in a band with Kevin. And he said, Jackie, I got to tell you, I'm the biggest fan of stand-up comedy because my band was playing at the bottom line and we had just started our set and our bass player broke a string and he had to go like halfway uptown to his apartment to get a string. He said, so I had to hold court for 20 minutes on my own. And he said, from that minute, I've had so much respect for you poor bastards that are up there alone because it's it can get very lonely very fast. And I always think that's very funny, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, let me tell you what. I, I was the guy in, in Rat Race Choir that did that. When Mark would blow up a stack and they'd have to put something else out there, I was the one telling the golf joke or whatever. And, you know, so I, I know what it's like. But I'm also protected by I have this whole set of drums around me and a microphone. And if I bomb, it's not like I'm doing, you know. Yeah. And so I, I wondered, because I was thinking about this, and I was, I was really looking forward to this. Because as much as these conversations are informative for the audience, this one, I have a lot of, you know, I have some solid questions. Now, being... And I, and I have some probably not true answers. But, but as my, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you a quick story about true answers. Okay. I'm, I'm working with John Entwistle and I'm doing a record up in, in Woodstock and the girl who owns the studio says to me, is it true that John Entwistle and Keith Moon experimented with livers to find out which alcohol they should drink and I said um, I haven't heard that one but I'll go home tonight I'll, I'll call and I'll ask so I call him up and he laughs ha, 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 ha. no 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 that was, a, that was an article that we read in the doctor's office about experiments that they did on chicken livers and that uh, well, brandy was the best thing to drink for your liver so I said oh okay and then I said I'll straighten her out tomorrow he said no 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 her story's much better <laughs> I, I listen when I was I, I think in college I don't even remember it was so long ago I read an interview with uh I think it was Keith Richards it might have been Mick Jagger but more likely Keith Richards and it was about him and it said how when his addictions him and him and Mick their addictions got really bad how they would go to Switzerland and swap out they take out their blood and cleanse yeah. it and put it back in they'd start over and I was like how fucking unfair is that to the rest of us all of us drunks and they get to start over and then not long ago like a year or two or three years ago maybe it was even in keith's book he said yeah you know you get so sick of getting interviewed and they asked the same goddamn questions he said <laughs> some guy asked me about uh did i worry about drinking i said no mate you know we just go to switzerland and get our blood swapped out <laughs> he said he said i totally fucking made it up i just needed something to tell it and here i've been telling everybody this story for decades you know well i heard that about yeah. keith richards and also yeah. jimmy page yeah and you know it, it's and i'll tell you what i was doing you know talk about those guys I'm doing an interview on that same tour that, that you were on with, with Entwistle, and the guy says to him, uh, uh, John, uh, do you have a drug problem? And he says, the only problem I have with drugs is finding them. <laughs> <laughs> He's a character. <laughs> oh, man. And now, listen, wait. I got a question. I, sure. I, I, uh, when I played in the 70s, we had a two-man band two guitars, and then we eventually added a, a keyboard and the guy played bass with his left hand. But the biggest we got was three pieces. So we were teeny. But we played at these places in Massapequa and East Meadow called Neptune Pub. And the guy and his son bought a club in the Hamptons in Quag called Neptunes. And we went and played the afternoon, uh, like from four to six. Beers were like eighteen for fourteen cents, you know, one of those deals. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the first band was Baby, a band Baby, named Baby. Yeah. And the next band was the Rat Race Choir. Oh. And all of a sudden, they got a call, and they came up to me and my partner and said, "Listen, 
baby's truck broke down on the Jersey Turnpike. They're not going to be here. You're going to have to fill in for them. Uh, Steve, I tell you, it was not, we didn't get through the first verse of the first song before that fucking club was empty, man. <laughs> but we stayed around and watched you guys, and I, I pretty sure it was you guys. And it was all I know is my ears were bleeding. It was so. That loud. would have been us. Was, yeah. That would have been us. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? I mean, the thing that. I wonder because I've been. We went to the taping of a comedy show once. Yeah. Uh, we were with a friend of ours who had tickets, and I've you know I've seen. I had a you know I had the club upstate where we had Howie and a couple of comedians up there, but um, touring for me in a band, I'm on a bus. There's you know probably too many people, and you know there's crew because there's all kinds of stuff. What is the touring contingent? For you, I mean, is it you're just going from place to place? Is somebody with you? I didn't. I I have a very very among us among strange characters like us. I have an even stranger career because uh, when I started in comedy, there was no such thing as comedy clubs on Long Island, and we like we started. I started doing shows in bars with my guitar amp because I transitioned from musician to comedian, and I'm not even a comedian. I just tell dirty jokes. And then we started, we started doing stuff and doing this stuff. And then I had a club and I, I never really went on the road, the road. I only did a little, like I, I did six weeks in the South with, with Rich Jenny. And, and that was at least two of us. Yeah. You know? uh, and two people is a lot more than one. You well, know? It's tw yeah, twice as many. <laughs> but in the very beginning, in the very beginning, when we all worked together, like the two, three, four, five guys in a car going to gigs, and it was just like you're talking about. It wasn't, but it wasn't a bus. It was guys in a car, and the camaraderie was ex just incredible. And the stories are still flowing. But of then course. I got to the Howard Stern show and got big, and I started headlining like at the Chicago Theater or at the State Theater in Denver and these places. But it was just me. And maybe an, maybe the MC would be the local DJ or they'd get a local guy. So I was alone. And I'm telling you, it's it's very low. You know, if there's just one other person to bitch at, you're all set, you know. But when it's just you, you know, you can't come. You can't make twelve thousand dollars and complain to the guy that just made forty dollars that this is a tough life. Because yeah. they don't, they really don't I, I, I hear you. But but by the same token, I'm. I know about that that loneliness, that road loneliness, and I thought to myself, wow, you know, I mean, if you're out there for six, eight weeks at a time, uh, especially, but I never thought that maybe um, uh, a bill would travel together, you know, like two guys, but still, it's got to be. But I never did, I never did the toy, like when I was on Stern, I'd fly to Vegas and back, or I'd fly to Chicago yeah. and back. Well, you were, and I mean. Friday and Saturday, you know, like not, you know, the. The Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I did that uh, for a couple of years, but it wasn't a tour. It was just like one, like a club in Nashville or a right. club in St. Louis and a club in Missouri. Or, you know, they were kind of strung together however you could. But uh, but it's the same hell. You know, it's, it's still, you're on an airplane by yourself. You're waiting in, in an airport by yourself. You're in a limo by yourself. You're in a, you know, I, I wrote a song. That's not the worst of it. The, the limo, the plane, all that is at least distraction. Sitting in a goddamn hotel room all day to wait to go get drunk and do 45 minutes worth of jokes. You're ready to slash your wrists, you know. It's crazy. Yep. But the good news is, that when you get to the club, you are so happy to see human beings. It doesn't matter what they are. <laughs> what a friendly guy. God, this guy Jackie is so friendly. Well, you're the first human being I've seen in 48 hours. Of course, you know. You're absolutely right. You know. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm, doing? I'm, I'm blowing the doorman, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, but I mean. <clears throat> So, well, Stern happened, I mean, and, and well-deserved. Boy, the chemistry, and I experienced it firsthand a couple of times, the yeah. chemistry in there was just undeniable. I mean, what a shot. How did that happen? You know, uh, it's really funny. Um, I hope you know, so. You, 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 you go up and you go down, you know, like, like uh, right now I'm, I'm at the point, uh, I always make the same quote. Uh, that Jackie Mason says, he says, 
I never have to work again unless I want to buy something. <laughs> <laughs> but here I was. If you, if you take my life and connect the dots backwards, it looks like I knew exactly what I was doing and I knew where I was going. I had no idea. Like at some point, you know, you quit your last band and you say, if I drop out of this now, nobody will ever know. Nobody will ever care. All that work will mean nothing. But um, <clears throat> my band recorded a song in the 70s at the workshop recording studios. And the guys like me asked me to work there. And I learned enough about recording to know how to make an album. And then we started doing comedy at a place in Huntington <clears throat> that was just a restaurant. And I had my, you know, my guitar amp with a, with a microphone input into it. And I hung microphones. And I recorded my vocal and the house laughs into a Nakamichi cassette player and chopped it up with a razor blade. And that was my first comedy album. Wow. And I, and I did three comedy albums, you know, slicing them with a razor blade. I know, I did. Tape. <clears throat> and then along the way, <clears throat> excuse me, when I put out my first album, <clears throat> I sent them or gave them away to everybody. And it's so funny because here it is 1979 and I'm standing at the door and saying, you want to buy my album? And people buy my album for five bucks and I'm autographing it, which is so exciting. I've been a comedian six months, but I got my own album because I knew how to do that. It's baking a cake. You buy right. flour, you got some water, you got an oven, you can have an album, right? Uh. <clears throat> so I'm selling these albums and the guys are breaking my balls. The other comics are making fun of me. Look at this idiot with his album. Look at, and then one day somebody goes, wait a minute. We each made $40. He's walking away with an extra 70 or $80. Maybe he's not such an idiot, you know? Hello. <clears throat> and that was decades before anybody's. Now you can't go to a show without somebody selling. But then I made a second album and gave them to everybody. And third album and gave them to everybody. <clears throat> and then I was working in Washington, D.C. And the owner of the club said, hey, there's a guy that used to do <clears throat> broadcasts in his underwear on Friday mornings from the club. He's a great radio DJ. He just got fired. He's going to New York City. You should look him up. I never heard of the guy. I didn't know from radio. I'm a, I'm a hippie. I listen to the Eagles and my cassette player. Right. <clears throat> so I sent my three albums, you know, Howard Stern, Carrie, WNBC, AM, Rockefeller Center. And like a month later, you know, my, my girlfriend calls me up and says, hey, that guy Howard Stern just called. He wants you to call. So I wow. called and he got right on the air. He said, hey, man, we listen to your albums. You know every joke. You want to come hang out on the air? I said, sure. I went in. I sat down with Howard and Robin and Fred. And we laughed our asses off for four hours. And Howard said, you know what? You're a lot of fun. Why don't you come back next week? And I came back once a week for free right. for, for three years. Wow. I, so I paid my dues and slowly but surely I was giving him ideas and notes and, and suggestions for lines. And then he went to mornings and I was a full member of the cast and we went to Pluto. Absolutely yeah, went you, to Pluto. You sure did, bro. And, 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 and well deserved. I mean, that's, that's, I'm glad to hear <clears throat> that he did the right thing after a while. Um, no, 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 it was, it was really good. It was really good. You know, no, uh, of course, I mean, you can't buy that. You can't, you, you can't buy that kind of experience. That's hey, look, I mean, the proof of the pudding look backwards. You know what I mean? Like it's, uh, it's like you said, the hookers like give it, he like the juice guys like watching the hookers give the money back. <laughs> oh, <man>. uh, <laughs> but I got to tell you something, and this is a segue because I'm going to go back because I, I wanted to talk to you about comedy. I gotta, are you, are, am I talking to you in a time capsule or a space capsule? It looks like, you're, <laughs> yes, it looks yeah. like you're sitting on the moon in a space capsule. No, I'm in the, I'm in the, uh, the space station because yeah. I, you know, COVID, I thought I'm safe out here for a while. Okay. And who I keep hearing this pretty girl. Is that your wife? Your that is my producer of all <laughs> things, but children, Lori Longo, my wife for See? how long? 37 years. 37 oh my years. God. Yeah. That, that's a prison sentence. <laughs> for well, some people, yeah, we, we, uh, yeah, I'll tell you what, I, yeah. I, meant for her. <laughs> <laughs> I still love him. Yeah. My yeah. Best uh, yeah. No, we yeah. have a good time. Yeah. That's your problem. <laughs> it is. <laughs> hey, my ex-wife lives two doors away and we double date with her. Figure that one out. You know, really? you know what? I get that because the parts that used to work still work and you just adjust. I, that doesn't sound all that strange. 
you know, to and the me. parts that used to work that don't work anymore is no longer an issue. Exactly. <laughs> For anyone. So there you go. Um, Online, you know, I could still do it twice. Yeah. Yeah, my favorite is the one in the fall. <laughs> Man, you're just naturally now, funny, right? Yeah, oh, no, you're, yeah. yeah. It's just old crap I've been telling since I was in second grade. Go ahead. I yeah, didn't but, it's, but it's not It's not even that. It's a delivery. Yeah. I mean, you know, I could tell you. I tell you Rodney Dangerfield you, behind him there. Hey, hey. That's my guy. Hey, you what time you do back in Boys Town? This is, this is my COVID joke. So a guy knocks on the neighbor's door and the neighbor answers and he says, hey man, since the COVID hit, I haven't seen your wife. And his neighbor says, oh, she's out back in the garden. He says, well, I was just out there. I didn't see her. And his neighbor says, well, you got to dig down a little bit. <laughs> That's funny. And, and that gets funnier and funnier with every every other month of lockdown. It's yes, it, it gets does. Funnier and funny. So. so, so now, I mean, and this is. Man, I this, bet everybody wants I'm to actually that gonna, party. I'm actually <laughs> going to give you a fix for this next problem because I've I've been thinking about this shit all day, man. I mean, I'm like, and I wonder how the and I don't want to go to politics, no, but it, no, but it, no, 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 no. no, no. But the I answer, wonder, the answer to your question is not at all. Really? Is that right? It hasn't affected the medium at all. No, no, I'm talking about me. You know, over the course of time, things uh, round itself off. Like on my first album in 1979, there were a lot of Pollock jokes. Pollock, Pollock. <clears throat> Pretty quickly, within a year, I stopped saying Pollock because that's insulting. And I say Polish, which is still basically as insulting. You know, yeah. I say the Jewish guy, the black guy, but I never use the really disparaging words. I finally learned that I can't say midget anymore, although... Very often I do. I guess that's just as heinous. But um, <clears throat> I've always been the same guy telling the jokes. And anybody that sees me on stage, if they can't tell that the only thing on my mind is making them laugh, then they're a moron. You know, I got no agenda. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm not trying to turn anybody on into this, onto that. There's no politics. There's no nothing. I'm just trying to make you laugh. Right. And I've had, you know, I had a Polish group of people complained about me and I said come to my show and they came to my show and they came up and said yeah you did Polish jokes but you did black jokes and fat jokes and you made fun of yourself and made fun of your own mother you know you, you're you right across the board there's no harm no foul you know yeah. <clears throat> I, I tell you as far as what's going on though you know I don't even know if it's the if it's the goddamn political correctness as much as it is nobody's funny all these everybody gets up there and they're so cool and they're so smart, and they're so hip. But the, and I and I say to myself, you left out the part about making people laugh. Make them laugh out loud. People say, "Oh, Jack, these shows just a bunch of stupid jokes." All we did was laugh. Well, what the fuck do you think I'm doing? <laughs> Hello, what do you think? Everybody, if I had a nickel for every guy that, or girl that came up to me and said that is the hardest I've ever laughed for an hour. That's great. If somebody comes up and says, you know, I didn't really learn anything or what are your politics? Like, that, <laughs> that's not my job. No. You know, it's not my job. It's not my job Come to sing on. opera. You know, it's not my job to teach you how to make cookies. It's my job <laughs> to make you laugh your balls off. So that's my well, job. I, you know. I'll tell you what I discovered because, you know, I, I'm, <clears throat> I, I'm a musician. I play on stage and, and I'm a live musician. So doing this format is interesting and new and different and I don't want to offend but I like telling jokes too and I've got some killer jokes you know some funny stuff I'm sure you've heard most of it but you pull it out here and there and what I dis what I discovered is that if you turn the what shall we call them what, what do we Polak jokes. <laughs> if you turn the Polak jokes into drummer jokes yeah. everybody thinks it's funny. <clears throat> Right. You know, yeah, so many, you know, blonde jokes, you yeah. know, and I, yeah. I use, you know, I use instead of Italian, I say Ravelli, and instead of Pola <laughs> Polish, I say Stokowski, and instead of Black, I say Washington, you know, sometimes I do that, and, so, and sometimes I don't bother, you know, but uh, yeah, it's so easy to make it gentle, and you know, it turns out that Polish jokes, 
we're at the age where we've seen enough stupid people and done enough stupid things ourselves. You don't even have to make it a nationality. You no, know, you, you can don't. just tell it as a guy. You know, a guy jumps out of a plane with a parachute and he completely forgets what to do. He got, he took the training, but he completely spaced it out and he's <laughs> zooming down like a million miles an hour. He's freaking out. And all of a sudden he passes another guy who's on his way up. <laughs> he's he's, he's saying, Hey man, you know anything about parachutes? And the other guy says, no, you know anything about lighting gas stoves? <laughs> <laughs> They not oh. like a Polish joke. That was a Polish guy and a black guy. You know, you had right. a lot of gas stove, but it doesn't need it because we're older right. now and we all we're all stupid and we're yeah, all it's, forgetful. Yeah. We're all idiots except for me. Yeah. It's pretty funny, and I agree. And so, <laughs> and you know uh, what? Also, is the older we get, I don't know about you, but when you're a kid, Henny Youngman's a little bit funny, but Henny Youngman gets funnier every five minutes every yeah. year because all that marriage stuff when you start living with a woman or a woman starts living with you and trying to go through it you know he just gets funnier and yeah, funnier he's... and funnier because because marriage is it's an impossible situation you know it's great I liked yeah. your fire extinguisher. Yeah. Oh joke. God, the the, the 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 old lady in the store oh. with the dildos that was I, priceless. Oh, yeah. I, I you know I I, I had a girlfriend that just every once in a while she'd turn to me and go, "Give me a red one." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, let me—I got to ask you a question. Do you know the one about the plastic surgeon with the dial in the back of the lady's head? Oh. Is this oh. the one where your vagina's on your chin? I mean, yeah, that yeah. explains the. You've you got bags under your eyes. Oh, those are your tits. Oh, that explains the beard. That, that, that's a, they, there's so many versions of that joke. You know, the guy goes to the doctor and he's got a big pimple in the middle of his forehead, a huge pimple in the middle of his forehead. And he says, Doc, the thing's so ugly. And the doctor says, Geez, I can't believe it. You got a penis growing out of your forehead. And the guy says, Jesus Christ, Doc. What are we going to do? And the doc says, well, I'll just have to wait till it's fully grown and then I can remove it. He says, fully grown? I can't go through all those years looking up at a dick. He says, well, it won't be that long after a couple of years, the balls will cover your eyes. <laughs> yeah. it's, all, it's all the same joke. It's but it's <laughs> but it's beautiful. It, I, um, I, I'll tell you what, Gene Cornish, you know Gene, right, from the Rascals? I love Gene. I, I we used to call each other once in the middle. You know, I'd call him in the middle of the night and give him a joke, and then he'd call me and tell me a joke I knew already. <laughs> he, right, of course. He, he does the same thing to me now. I guess I'm I'm the guinea pig now. Yeah. He calls me up the other day. I see it's Gene. I said, hey, Gene, how you doing? He said, do you know that to be kissed while you're sleeping is the most intimate and sincere display of love, unless you're in jail. <laughs> hangs up the phone. That's a great line. That's I met him on the Joey Reynolds show like 20 years ago. Wow. You know, it's so funny because when I was a kid, uh, my buddy went to uh, New York Tech and they had school dance at the... Uh, I think I, whatever it's called now, I don't know. It used to be called the Four Seasons over in Syosset. And the band for his school dance was the Young Rascals. And oh. I'm talking about on a platform about six inches tall. And they they just, I must have just started doing gigs around. I don't think, I, I ain't going to eat my heart out anymore. I don't think that had even come out yet. <laughs> and I was, I was like spellbound out of my mind watching these guys and now they're all my friends and I can't wrap my head around you know meanwhile I'm friends with Felix and friends with Gene and friends with Eddie but they can't they can't be in the same room oh I know they, they just know. Gene just had to get a, a, give a deposition yeah. and it's like oh, uh, lost so great, great it's friends. crazy hey you know one of those shows I did for Toby uh, Felix was on it Felix and his rascals and I introduced them and he said Jackie, I almost couldn't walk out on stage. He said, I almost pissed in my pants and listened to your jokes. So, mm -hmm. any, you know, anybody, this is a guy who was, you know, I had the whole, the whole uh, student body of Michigan State, you know, dancing to uh, 
people got to be free, you know, and I'm, these uh, are my boys. These are my boys. I didn't, I never met them. I'm just talking about my heroes. And then you get to know these guys and it's just, you know, you know, yeah. you know, the, you know exactly. I do. I know exactly. That's what this is all. That's what this whole show is about is that family <laughs> that we all got come to. And one of the reasons I was so looking forward to, to your call is because it's such a integral comedy is such an important part of all of aspects of entertainment business, mm -hmm. not just, you know, live on stage, but film. And uh, it's, it's and so important. And you know what, important. Steve, everybody, everybody loves jokes. You know, they did a documentary on me that's not out yet because there's no film festivals to take it to. And my buddy Ian, who did, made the documentary, rode with me all the way to South Pennsylvania, and recorded two shows. And I mean, Tape me eating chicken and tape me changing my clothes in the parking lot. I mean, every five seconds he was up my ass with the camera. And we're on our way home from South Southern Pennsylvania and he puts away the camera and my phone rings. And it's and it's uh, it's Mark from the Turtles. Ugh. And he's like, he's Jackie, we're on the bus. We're in the middle of Kansas. We don't know what the fuck we're doing. We're all going out of our mind. I'm going to put you on speakerphone. You got to tell some jokes. So I told John, him and the cow sales and the association and all these people and blew them away. And I'm like, I can't believe the fucking documentary camera. The, the, that would have been the most interesting thing in the oh, documentary. Man, yeah. but it was so flattering because here's all these entertainers calling up and saying, entertain us, you know, with your stupid jokes. But I'll take that. You hey, know? man, yeah. let me tell you what. It's, you know, we, you go to a party and everybody gets a little toasted, right? And there's two guys. One guy who's pontificating about taxes and the State of the Union, and the guy who has everybody around him laughing their ass off. Which one, right. you know, where are you sitting? I'm over by that guy. I, the way I always used to tell it is if you go, every party you go to, there's two groups of people. There's the people in the huddle telling dirty jokes and the people that are trying to think of a joke so they can get in the huddle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's right. And okay. And, and, um, you know, I was always, uh, always loved weed. I mean, I, I thought I was funnier when I was stoned. Do you think that's a scientific fact? <laughs> no, that, that, like, back to you when it comes to you, I never, I think once in 40 years, I smoked a little pot before I went. I have never smoked pot before I went on stage. And Rodney, until the very end when he's very old, he's like, yeah, no, never, you never get high before, you know, after, you get drunk after, you know, get drunk at late after, not before. And because by pot, you know, my act is not, a pothead act it's, it's no, it's really not. get crazy it's high energy be, be nutty you know not that potheads don't like it but that you know i'm not gonna be like hey man no 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 i wasn't i i was talking about inspirational not not uh performance wise I, do you think funnier thoughts when you smoke a joint or you know is there a is there a method to it somehow? i i don't think so you know i wrote my autobiography i never I never said, you know what, let me get stoned before I start writing because it, <clears throat> you know, I, and I'm the biggest pothead in the world. I've been growing pot for 25 years. You know, you wouldn't believe who smoked my pot. Everybody in the fucking world. I would believe, I believe, you I know, believe. Tim Burton, Robert Altman, Julia uh, R Roberts and George Clooney and, you know, all, all these characters because I know friends of friends and there's nothing like homegrown pot because you know nobody's fucked with it. Right. You know, so yeah. many people. So many people say, "Hey, yeah, this will get you high," and you know that somebody. Yeah. Let me let me see how high I get 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 Steve Longo. Let, let me give him some fucking PCP. You know what I mean? So. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm I'm going to tell you two two quick weird pot <laughs> stories. One. Take your time. It's your show. Yeah, that's the truth. That's what the, that's what they told me. But I'm out here until they confirm that. Uh, <laughs> I'm 16, I'm making a record at uh, CBS Studios. The Rascals, unbeknownst to me, have just broken up in the control room. This is 1970. Gene confirmed that for me years later. I go upstairs, I do my tracks. We were trading out time with a producer. We would do somebody's tracks if they would give us studio time. And somebody said to me, Edgar Winter's upstairs in Studio E, you should go up there. He's recording. I, so I thought, okay. And this was CBS, if you've been there, you know every studio is exactly 
exactly the same, and the elevator lets you out into the lobby of the studio. So you're in it. So I go up. I think it was Studio E. I go up there, and I'm, you know, I'm a kid. I'm, and and Edgar Winter looks at me and smiles and says, "Come on in, man." I said, "Okay, man." And you're a kid with the and, hair down. And I, yeah, I'm a kid. You know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, long story short, she says, "You want? You won't get high." I said, "Sure." Are you kidding me? Look at my hair. <laughs> so. So he goes through his pack of cigarettes and pulls out the joint that has the little mark on it. Oh, and, boy. Oh, oh yeah. boy. <laughs> and I light it up, and he passes it around, and it goes around. And all of a sudden, now I have enough experience, even at 16, to know I, I must leave now. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I said, listen, guys, I got to get down to my session. And I'm standing in the elevator, right? And, it seemed, and the door closes, and it seemed like I'm in there for a half hour. Well, I was in there for a half hour. <laughs> I never pushed a button. And <laughs> the thing finally starts to move and scares the shit out of me. It opens up, and who's standing there but Jimi Hendrix? And not only is it Jimi Hendrix, but he thinks he knows me. And, and he's and, dead. And he's dead. So I'm thinking, great. I just discovered that Hendrix is not dead, and now he's, and that's why he's being nice to me, because he's going to kill me. Anyway, we go into the studio. He says, come on in. He's talking about where we get our heroin from. And I'm like, he's what? Like, what? Yeah, I, I, my band is nowhere in sight. He said, did you just go see Rosie? And I said, well, I'm not for a while. And I, I'm in there, and, and they mic him up like this with the microphone over there. And I'm looking, and Jackie, I'm telling you, it's the hair, and it's the fur, and the feathers, and it's Hendrix. It's purple and white. And you're on PC. And I'm on <laughs> Angel Duster. Thank you. Edgar. And so I'm sitting in the vocal booth and I said, all right, you want to give it a test? And he says, sure. And he goes, one child grows up to be. And it was freaking Sly Stone. Now, see, you, you talk about politically incorrect. You just spent 10 minutes saying they all look alike. <laughs> no, just two of them. Just two of them. And only when you're on Angel Dust. Yeah. And the other thing, and Whistle was not a pothead at all. Did not like oh, pot. No, no, no. But he loved the best of everything. Loved the finest cognac, the most car, this beautiful thing, this Capa de Monte. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so we're at, we're, we do a show at BB King's. And I don't know if you know Ari, the booker. He comes out and he says, hey, Steve, I know you like the good pot. He said, this is the good pot. And so I said, oh, great, man. Let's after the and show. The, the, yeah, after the gig. And the minute I hit this thing, I knew, oh, you could just tell. Grown at 40,000 feet, picked by the right hand of left-handed people. You know, I mean, it's one of those with the story. And right, so right. I said, I said, John, you got to try this. Oh, no, 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 no. I said, well, what? No? Aren't you the guy that, that the best of everything, the best of everything? This is the best. And he goes, Really? And I said, yeah. He takes a big hit, and I said, now hold it in like a grown-up, right? And he holds it in big time. And so we leave. He doesn't say a word. And this is, a, you know, I could go on with this forever. But we get in the cab, and we're going back to the plaza, and he says to me, uh, Steve, when does this stop? <laughs> So I said, oh, man, I said, it won't be long. I said, I'm sorry. I said, didn't realize you are having a bad time. We get back to the plaza. This is the beautiful part, because remember, he's English. We get back to the plaza, right? And instead of in his, in his six-room palatial suite, instead of going and sitting on the couch, he gets in that uncomfortable wooden writing chair that they give you that looks like Louis XIV, and he's sitting in the thing like he's wired on gack out of his mind. And he says, oh, Steve, is this going to stop anytime soon? I said, are you still having a hard time? man listen i said i said all you need don't, don't worry about it i'll take care of it i go out to the mini bar english mini bar and i pull out the plaza bar and i go in there and i said all you got to do is eat this and you'll be fine and he said where did you get this and i said out of the mini bar he said you do know how much this is i said you want to sit there spinning for another 20 minutes you want to eat it? he ate it he ate it I'm sure it straightened them right out. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, eventually, yeah. Yeah, oh, something yeah. did. I'm not sure. That and something else. You know, yeah. you know I, grow, I grow great pot. And the first, uh, the first, I think, hippie fest that Toby did was in Newark. And I played with Godfrey and a different drummer named uh, Steve. Uh, Steve Murphy. Steve Murphy and a bunch of guys. And this is when I first met them. And I said, listen, I got some great homegrown pot. And they said, great. And me and Murphy went out to my car and got stoned. And then 
he texted me or emailed me. He said, Jackie, I got so high. I couldn't find the fucking hotel. I drove all the way home to South Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I said, so in other words, in other words, I'm a good gardener, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you, hey, listen, and, and respect, brother. I'll tell you Godfrey's story. Did you know Billy St. John, rest in peace? No, I just, I, that's a you name I've heard doesn't around, matter. You know. He he was the one who brought, you know, he was the one that brought things on the road, right? And it's Billy and I that are really running the tour. Well, he was and, best friends with Bobby Shinoda. Yeah, he was friends with, you know, he, it's, believe me, you're two degrees of separation. So anyway, <laughs> we're on the bus and we said, uh, everybody else is sleeping, been up all night and we're up, we're going to watch a movie. And we said, what do you want to watch? And Billy says, let's watch Natural Born Killers, you know, with Woody Harrelson, the right? So Godfrey comes out. He says, oh, are we watching a movie? I said, uh, yeah, but we're going to tune up first. You going to join us? And he said, what? And we said, come on, you got to smoke something. And this was like, you know, we called it stupid jerky because it looked like jerky in the bag, right? right. So we get him and he, he, he manned up, smoked the joint. I mean, did, and Godfrey's not a pothead. No. Smokes the joint, right? We watch the movie and the, we open up the things, you know, the, the shades and he's sitting there like this. <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, what happened, man? Uh, did that scare you? He said, yeah, a little. He said, but you know what really scares me? And we said, what? And he said, you guys smoke this all day long and you're running the tour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, faders. In the I love it. You know, I, I rode the bus with, uh, with the guys with Toby from uh, Los Angeles to Phoenix at some point. And it was... Uh, Oh, you know, it was Todd Rundgren and yeah, uh, and and Jack Bruce. There was about Alan four or Parsons. five. About four or five, you know, Alan. Uh, and I guess Alan, what's his face, didn't come. But there was, there was like, you know, whatever, like five or six major rock stars on yeah, this yeah. bus, and you know, and we stopped at like two in the middle of the night. We stopped like at a Walmart. <laughs> and these old rock and roll stars are walking around up and down. And I'm looking in, in the aisles of Walmart, seeing these homeless old people. And I'm like, they're not homeless old people. That's Todd Rundgren and that's Jack Bruce. <laughs> and I got, we got in the bus and I said, you cocksuckers. I said, Do you realize if this was 40 years ago, it'd be hookers and coke and I'd be having the time of my life. And I'm watching you assholes drink tea and play Scrabble and buy underwear at Walmart. Somebody got to put a pin in my eye. Not on our bus. Oh, Not God. on our bus. I, I'll tell you what, we picked up we picked up strippers in Austin and they were dancing on the bus for hours and they didn't realize we went to Dallas. John had to send them back in a cab. So, <laughs> that, was the year, that was the year before I met Toby. I, I, I never met John Entwistle. I, oh, I miss, man, you would have loved it. But that was the Walk Down Abbey Road tour, right? The first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was the first one. Yeah, Toby, I had a great tour. We went to, to Japan on that one. We did uh, Hawaii for the day. It was it was crazy. Uh, Ann but, Wilson was on uh, it. Yeah, Ann Wilson was on it. And, and it was a great time. It was. It wound up being the last year that we toured together, uh, John and I, before he passed. Yeah, last time you saw him. Yeah, Japan. it was the last time I saw him. Was the, wow. the last night of that tour. But uh, listen, you know, if he could have written it, that's what he would have written. Yep. Yeah. Right, right. You know, yeah. we're all so going to too long, and we'll still we'll we'll be having the same phone call twenty years from now. I guarantee you. Well, we'll have it sooner than that. I was I was asked, somebody asked me to ask you about <coughs> Sid. Sid. I don't know what that means. Sid, a story about Sid. Well, uh, first, I got to tell you that uh, Tom and Jagno from Omnipop uh, is the one who connected me and you. So I want to give him a shout out. Absolutely. On the, on the outside chance that he's uh, he's watching, he's a real Tommy boy. Pop. Yeah, Tommy is. Pop. Yeah. I've known him forever. Now listen, I'm in the, I'm in show business, so if you say Sid, the Sid Mandelbaum, my friend that runs the Rock and Wrap It Up charity, the Sid Bernstein, which is just spectacular. Did you know Sid Bernstein? Yeah, but I think it's the other Sid. S Sid from Rock and Wrap It Up. I don't I know. Guess I I don't know. I don't know. Cool. What did you know that uh, Peter Cooper Schmidt said to ask uh, you about the Zebra DVD? The, the Zebra DVD? Does that bring up any flashbacks? Well, Zebra, if you talk about the band Zebra, I met mm -hmm. them when I, was, uh, when I was working at the studio in Queens um, with Kevin Kelly. 
Zebra had a, a two week lockdown where it was just them in the studio and they were doing an album. We became really, really tight friends. And it was the week of Easter. And, uh, and I said to Randy, uh, whatever his name is, the, the guitar player. Jackson, the, Randy Jackson. I said to Randy Jackson, what are you doing for Easter? And he said, you know, I'm just in the hotel because I'm from New Orleans. I said, horse shit. And I dragged this long-haired, crazy rock and roll. Me, well, he's not crazy. He's probably the most tame guy there ever was. But I brought him yeah. home to my uh, to my family's house for Thanksgiving. Which you have to know, my fam like my grandmother was the just this crazy, crazy character. And whenever we had a, 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 a whatever you call the person that get, you pick on, you know, the the rube, right. we had somebody yeah. new at the dinner table. Couldn't couldn't wait, right? And we're having Thanksgiving dinner, and uh, Grandma's sitting there. And I said, "Randy, ask my grandmother about uh, about making the turkey." And you know, people are so polite. Especially, I used to have friends from college from Michigan State that were Midwest boys, so polite, so polite. And, you know, Mrs. Poole or Grandma, uh, tell us about how you how you uh, make the turkey. She says, "Well, you know, we get a nice bird and we rub it down with oil." And then, and then uh, we chop up some onions and celery and breadcrumbs, and and a and a a cup of unpopped popcorn, and we put it all together and mix it up and stuff the turkey with that and put it in the oven. Wow! And you know, and the kids like being so polite, you know, thinking unpopped popcorn. Well, yeah, yeah whatever she says. <laughs> and then, and then I say, but Grandma, how do you know when the turkey's done? And she says. When his asshole blows off. <laughs> <laughs> and the poor, the poor friend that's new to the table, just, oh, I must have gotten 10 different, 12 different people over the course of time. But Randy <laughs> still remembers. So those guys are great guys. And 30 years later, I got an email. Jackie, I don't know if you remember me. My name's Felix, and I was a bass player in a group called Zebra. And I wrote him back and said, What's wrong with you? I said, I embarrassed Randy at Thanksgiving dinner. We spent two weeks together. We got drunk and stoned and crazy. For you, I, I know you better than I know a lot of my family members. Do I know you? He says, well, listen, do you like country music? I said, yes. He says, well, my girlfriend massages the Jets and the Giants, and she also massages Willie Nelson. So we're going to see Willie Nelson tonight. Do you want to go? So I hadn't seen him in 25 or 30 years. And we met at a bar and went to see Willie at the Beacon. Not the Beacon, whatever downtown, Wilbur Theater, whatever. whatever it could have been the Beacon or... or uh, no, but it was downtown. And oh, downtown. So uh, spectacular. Winter Garden. It's a, anyway, yeah. Uh, uh, I'll think of it. But he says that after the show, we're going to get go on the bus with Willie and get stoned. And it's like 12 o'clock. And my day started at 6 o'clock sharp. We went on the air. And I'm like... Oh boy, talk about Sophie's choice, right? Uh, and <laughs> I, I, and uh, I got to go to the bathroom, and we're like on the second floor. And Wilbur, not the Will, what, what, whatever it was called, the bathroom was in the basement. So he had to go down two flights and then a whole nother flight. I went all the way down. I'm already drunk and stoned and took a piss. And I said, Jackie, if you go back up, to there and then go out in that bus, you're going to miss work and you're going to fuck up your life. <laughs> and instead of going up and staying with Felix and getting stoned with Willie, I went home and made it to work the next day. And some, by the grace of God, Felix said, listen, we got to try it again. So then I went to Westbury Music Fair and we got the bus with Willie and got stoned out of our heads. And it was, you know, I've been, I've been friends with him for 25 years. We, we exchange dirty jokes on email like once or twice a week. It's amazing. You know, he's such yeah. a character, you know. We uh, <laughs> we had his bus when I was playing with Leslie West. We had we had Willie's bus once, and I oh, said, that's great. Oh, "We're not going over the border, are we?" <laughs> 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 and I remember another time I was out with Leslie. We were coming in from Canada, and I'm a dog lover. I've always had dogs. I love dogs, and I see these 
labs, right? And they're up on these stainless steel tables and they're wagging their tails. And I said, wow, I said, check these dogs out. This is good. They're smiling. They're happy. And Leslie goes, it's not good if they're happy to see you, Steve. <laughs> these dogs, it's not good. Okay, Peter now writes, uh, uh, who? Okay. <laughs> oh, God. Man, I, all right, so now let's see. I got to right, tell you, the worst thing that ever happened to me is I used to network with everybody that came on the show. and Howard would never introduce us to anybody, but I'd find out Roger Daltrey, Clarence Clemens, Willie, all these people. I'd find out who the manager was, who the agent was, who the booker was. I'd get their address and send them my dirty joke CDs. And you know that every musician loves dirty joke CDs. And they would come back on the air the next time they were, you know, coming through town. And they'd walk in, they'd say hello to Howard, and they'd say hello to me because they'd forget that they had never met me because now they know me from my ah, CDs. Ah, right. So, so it, was, it used to get Howard crazy. But I finally get onto Willie's bus. And so here we go. I say, Willie, I got a bunch of homegrown. He's like, oh, well, roll it up. So I'm sitting at that little Formica table with him. Mm -hmm. And my girlfriends, uh, my wife, as a matter of fact, my, I was still married. My wife was there, a couple of the New York Giants, and uh, whoever else, and me and Willie are sitting there. And I get out of the joint and he says, we need a match. And Steve, <laughs> I'll never forget, I'm like, Willie, you're a thousand years old. You've been on this bus for 50 years. How the fuck could a pothead not know where there's a match on his bus? Like, but we start looking and you know, you know those buses, all the little drawers. I know, yeah. I pull open, I just swear on my mother, this is true. I pull open a drawer and there's my CD, Hot Dogs and Donuts. And I'm like, I got a heart on. I couldn't believe it. I was like, look at this. Holy fucking God. And I took it out of the drawer. It was still in the plastic. Oh! oh. I said, Willie. You just turned what was going to be the greatest story of my career into the worst possible story. And I thought he was going to piss himself. He laughed so hard. That's at right. I, at least it made it to the bus. It's a fucking coaster. <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. That's that, that, really. That'll keep you humble, Steve. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, can you still get these? Is it on your site? I mean,. I, you know, but everything's downloadable now, but uh, I, I I need to get your street address and send you a pile of stuff. I got, I got a lot of funny stuff. I, I you know, if you like, to, if you don't like dirty jokes, I'm the wrong guy. If you like dirty jokes, there's <laughs> I know who else. you are. No, but you know what I'm saying to the average person? Like, you yeah. know, it's like, don't, if you like opera, don't go to me. If you like dirty jokes, come to me. But I mean, I got the market cornered. It's a little uh -huh. bit scary. It's a little scary. Well, and do you do jokes. you write? Yeah, I love dirty jokes. Yeah. Do you write your own material? No, I I occasionally write a joke here and there, and it's funny when they come back around and somebody goes to tell me one, and I'm like, you know, that's one of the ones I put in the pile. But I've been telling old jokes, and they're not old jokes because no such thing as an old joke because it's all completely subjective. An old a joke, if if you've heard the joke already, to you it's an old joke. If you haven't heard the joke yet, it's a new joke. And that applies to every joke to every person. You know, if somebody heard a joke a week ago that I've been telling since 1945 and they go, oh, that's an old joke. That means they heard it a week ago. You know, it, right, right. They, all the jokes have been around and around and around and around. And it's just it's just fun. It's just silly. You know, it, it is fun. And, and I'll tell you, I got into uh, about Nah, when I came down to Florida a year or so after I came down here, I got sucked into the evil game of golf. And the golf jokes are freaking phenomenal. Do you, Have you heard the one about the uh, American businessman that goes to Japan? Absolutely. I. You know what? Uh, there was a girl uh, who was at one of the holes to make sure you didn't cheat, saying you got a hole in one to win right. a car. And I said, Christy, they got four girls here. You don't need to be here. And she was from Dallas. And she got in the car, uh, cart and we started driving around. And I had already told the joke to the guys in the cart. So every time somebody hit a bad shot, I go, oh, Nashagayena, Nashagayena. <laughs> however you tell it. <clears throat> and after a while, she finally said, Jack, Jack, what is this Nashagayena you keep saying? 
And I said, well, you know, I, you weren't on, on the cart yet, but it's a joke. And I told her the joke and she laughed and she said, you know, that's funny. She says, I, I didn't know what you're saying. I, I thought maybe Nashkai ain't, I thought maybe that was one of those Yiddish expressions. <laughs> <laughs> See, I use Kawasaki, so there's no messing it. Uh, that is a great, great joke. Here's a great one for the next time you play golf, if you haven't heard it. A guy walks into the pro shop, and his face is all cut up and bloody. The pro says, what happened to you? And he says, I just blew an eagle. <laughs> <laughs> the, see, now, do you know the one about the penguin that... <clears throat> The, the, his car blows up in the little town? Of course. Okay. You know, I, I tell everybody I'm a social leper. You know, because most, to be polite, you're supposed to just pretend you haven't heard a joke, especially if a woman starts a joke. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, they, the definition of a gentleman is, is someone who hasn't heard the story. And <laughs> I'm like, I can't do that because I can't have some chick come up and say why the chicken cross the road and say i don't know and have her say to get the other side and spend the rest of her fucking life telling everybody i stumped that guy jackie the joke man he didn't know my joke so you know pe people go to you know tell me a joke and uh you know i, I do horrible stuff too you know like i'm not i'm not gonna finish this story but um it's okay it's okay no, so like, all right let me ask girls, you this girls, one. girls come up and say oh you're so dirty you're so dirty tell me a dirty joke Tell me a dirty joke. And I say, all right, how do you get two gay guys to, how do you get a gay guy to have sex with a girl? You, you put shit in her vagina. <laughs> <laughs> See now, Leslie. And, just... and, then, and then the girl says, okay, okay, you win. I'll leave you alone. And then, you know. <laughs> Leslie used to use the one on stage. My girlfriend told me to kiss her where it stinks, so I took it in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah I, oh, I loved him. What a character. Uh, me too. And and he called me just a few weeks before he passed. He said, Steve, I'm living in Florida now. And I said, yeah. good, how, good. How are you doing? How do you think I'm doing? I got one leg. <laughs> That's good to hear from you, I I loved him too, man. I, I loved him too. Um, yeah, well, okay. Yeah, that, that's a high note to go out on. You know. That is a high note to go yeah. out on. Uh, because what I was about to do was, was tell you my wife's least favorite golf joke. I'm going to save it no. for another time because yeah. I know you would get it and appreciate it. No, I, and I, I will, I, if it's her favorite joke, I'm going to laugh like that. No, it's her least favorite. She doesn't even think it's funny. It's, nobody thinks it's funny. Right. Nobody now, laughs. Can, may I try? Nobody laughs. And if you've heard it, just flag me off, okay? Uh. Guy shows up to his weekly foursome with one ball. You with me so far? Okay. The rest of the foursome says, what's up with the one ball? What are you? He said, this ball is amazing. He said, if you hit it in the water, it floats to the surface and it finds the nearest shore. And if you hit it in the woods, it emits a sound that can be heard up to 3,000 yards away. And it'll send up a light. And it's a, just an amazing piece of equipment. And they said, where'd you get it? And he said, I found it. <laughs> I, I I have always thought that, that is so funny and there are so many people there's so many people that don't think that's funny and that's they don't. Like, they don't because laugh. it's it's on beyond funny. You know, there's some jokes that I call, I use as like barometer jokes and I'm like if people don't laugh at them, uh you know, you know there's a there's a joke there's there's a joke that I used to tell and my other this girlfriend of mine used to laugh so hard. And I tell people that if I actually say it in my act after I'm done, <clears throat> if you don't think that's funny, I don't care about you. But oh, I heard you say it a couple of times in the routine. Yeah. That joke well, alone was worth the price of admission. No, it's, right, right. So, yeah. <clears throat> so a guy goes in uh, to a bar and there's a pretty blonde behind the, uh, behind the counter. And there's a sign behind it that says, uh, cheese sandwich, $5, chicken sandwich, $7, Hand job fifty dollars, and he says to the blonde, he says, "Are you the one that gives the hand jobs?" She says, "Yep." He says, "Wash your hands and get me a cheese sandwich." <laughs> <laughs> that's great. There's, okay. there's people that don't think that's funny, and I'm like, if you don't think that's funny, you you, you don't belong in my life. All right, you know? 
stop. Please stop me if you know this one, because this is this is this is one of my maybe maybe I get this one by. <laughs> Guy shows shows up to the golf course and he's got no one to go out with, and they pair him up with Vito from New York, who's there on a business trip. No, nothing. Not ringing a bell. No, but, but but it could be five. You know, Vito could okay. be a priest. Okay. <laughs> Vito so, could be a priest. Right. So so no no so so Vito. Uh, has his clubs in the back, and the guy is a member at this club, and he lives on the grounds. And he says, so, Vito, what do you do? And Vito says, oh, I'm down here on business. He said, yes, yes, what's your business? He said, uh, I'm a hitman. Yeah, no? I think I could save you a thousand bucks. Okay, what about the talking dog? That's awesome. You're talking to me, Longo. You're talking to me. You didn't pick me up on the side of the road. Oh, uh, no. Believe I I, uh, fucking jo- I, that's a great this is r- Don't get me wrong. That is a great, great joke. It is a great joke. It is a great joke. But, I'll uh, tell you, uh, this is kind of a long story, but uh, I used we drove out to Albuquerque. Me and my partner, we had a 1955 bright yellow Cadillac hearse. That's what we traveled in. We're in the mountains of Albuquerque playing at the Golden Inn in Golden, New Mexico. And there's a rich guy that used to fly in and land behind the inn with his beautiful girlfriend and come in and get drunk. I don't know what the connection was to the place. And the guy was a fun guy, a rich guy, got around, and he got word that there was a guy staying at the Golden Inn that knew a lot of jokes. So like a lot of people, it's you're, a joke tells like a, go, a gunslinger. You know, I know just like the way you are now, you're like, what What do I got that he hasn't heard? Yeah, what do I got that, yeah. That's what people are like. And this guy's like, I got one. So he comes up to me and this guy says, all right, I got one. And he's like the hero, the rich guy. He got the plane and the girl. He opened his mouth and I told him the punchline. And the guy's jaw, and he just... <sighs> It, it didn't compute, but then you back time it uh, because he said to me, nobody has ever heard that joke. He says, I sold that joke to Playboy 20 years ago, or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And uh, yuck, yuck, yuck. And I thought about it. And I remembered I had been told that joke by a waiter at Pipe and Rock Club in Locust Valley when I was a bus boy who must have been in college. When that issue of Playboy came out, you know, everybody's got a few jokes that they like to tell. And that was one of the jokes in this guy's wheelhouse. And he told it to me and I loved it. And I had always repeated it. And so when the guy started it, I recognized it and finished it. He said nobody has ever, ever in his life had ever known it. Uh, to make it, I'll make it as quick as I can. But a guy's got a, a down and out bar on the boardwalk in Coney Island. He's about to shut down forever. And a clam walks in. <laughs> and the clam says can i have a drink and that guy says, what the hell is you know sit down and gives him a you know a glass of scotch and the clam drinks a couple of hits of scotch and he starts telling the guy his life story and and the clam says you mind if i play the piano and the bar owner says go ahead so the clam starts playing the piano people walk along the boardwalk they see the clam playing the piano they could next thing you know the place is packed and Joe's like, do you want me? He says, my name's Joe. I'm Joe the Clam. You want me to come back tomorrow night? The guy says, I want you to come back every night. So Joe the Clam is there on the piano every night. The place is packed. They're making billions of dollars. They're getting women that did, they're living the life. Unbelievable. So one night, uh, it's late afternoon, and Joe the Clam walks in, and his shell is all broken and smashed. And the, oh. and the guy's like, what the hell happened to you? He says, listen, I was, I, I was fucking this lobster under the pier, and her, her, her dolphin boyfriend showed up. <clears throat> and I didn't see him coming. And he he gave me pretty much of a shellac. And, and the guy says, look, Joe, I'm going to put you up in my bed and tuck you in. But that blonde I've been hitting on for a couple of weeks, I think I got a shot with her tonight. So if we get in bed together, you know, shut shut up. And Joe's like, <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. So the guy, sure enough, comes home with the girl and takes her up to bed. And the next morning they wake up and uh, he looks over at her and he says, how was that? She says, "Oh, it was so great." He says, "Yeah, some good, some good stuff, huh?" She goes, "You are terrific." And he says, "Did you like when I went down on you?" She says, "What? What are you? What are you talking about?" He says, "Did you enjoy it when I went down on you?" And she goes, "You didn't go down on me." He goes, "Oh fuck! I ate my best friend." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, now so that's this guy, even this guy with the plane 
said this guy's got a bar on the boardwalk in Coney Island. And I said, yeah, I ate, I ate my best friend. And the guy was like, oh, oh, oh. That's, uh, man. Well, listen, I'll tell you what. Th that's the high note to leave it on. That Man, you are, I enjoyed this more than I can tell you, bro. Just I, I got to say two things. First of all, I do cameo.com slash Jackie Martling. If you like jokes, you want me to insult Steve, if you want me to insult his wife, if you want to say happy divorce to somebody, or, you know, people say, uh, my mother's turning 73, she loves shit jokes, she loves Jewish jokes, whatever you want to say to her, blah, blah, blah. It's cameo.com slash Jackie Martling. It's a lot of fun. That's the only thing I plug on these things. No, you I should. No, and and I'll, I'll put it on the site, cameo.com forward slash Jackie Martling. And uh, I'll do the same time. Thanks to Tom and Jagno for putting us together. And uh, man, yes, we got, we got you, we have not even made a dent in the stories we can tell. So uh, where are you in Florida? I'm on the West Coast in Fort Myers. I got a call two weeks ago to work in Fort Myers uh, at the, co the Comedy Laughing Cafe. Yep. Is that near you guys? Five minutes. Ah. Uh, well, the guy Five offered minutes. me like twelve dollars, and I said, "Well, if you make it fourteen, I might come." So it's just <laughs> you never know. But listen, make sure you have your guy uh, email me. No, we're gonna. I'm gonna do the whole thing. We'll do. Believe me, I I want to. Th this is the point. The best part of doing this show is reconnecting with old talented friends from the business, and I mean long time, not decrepit. And uh, I, no, man, I'm gonna reach out to you. There's some stuff for uh, us all to do. There's so many names and so much stuff that we got to bring up. That'll be you know, that'll be so much. You know what's funny is Billy Joel lives two miles and 12 tax brackets away from me. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, I've had almost this whole band on the freaking yeah. show. Yeah. But you know what we do on Fridays? Fridays is free for all Friday. It's the same key to get in. You can come in and say hello, tell a joke, stay the whole hour. It's it's you never know. Tom was in there last Friday, so you're welcome, Tom's man. Tom's in there tonight. Yeah, too. Tom's watching tonight, yeah. so he heard you shout out. Yeah, good, good, good. And and that's why I'm not the, the <clears throat> only reason, but that's why Lori is here because I want it to just be you and me backstage, you know, smoking a joint, laughing our asses off. And I want it to feel like that. And man, it felt it feels like that, Jack. Well, it's next time, great. next time, I'm literally going to sit here and smoke a joint. We'll see if I get funnier. <laughs> uh, you know what? <laughs> that that would come under si a science experiment, and I would be All willing. Right, I'm going to I'm gonna leave you with a very disgusting joke. All right. Okay? Grandpa's with his grandson, and they're sightseeing in Pennsylvania. And Grandpa says, "Sonny boy, you see that field over there?" That's where they fought the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. And you know, Sonny Boy, there's people that think the Battle of Gettysburg was the turning point of the Civil War. And the kid says, Doug, Grandpa, tell me something I don't know. He says, I, I could fit my whole fist in your grandmother's asshole. <laughs> 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 from, from the land of you can't make it up, I was in the middle of that joke. My girlfriend and Tom had to move their office into my little office here. And in the middle of that joke, that was Tom and Jagno's voice on his answering machine. If you heard a noise in the background, that was him saying, welcome to Omnipop. We're over here and we're about to shoot ourselves. <laughs> All right, well, let's do this again. Let's do it again. Say we will. To everybody, whoever you talk to, tell them I said. I'll that. tell them hello. I'm gonna get send you my numbers. I'll get your numbers. I'll say it. We'll do this. It'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Oh man, it was a, oh, it was man. a pleasure, and thanks for being had. Next time I get to see your wife, I'll have to send you a picture. <laughs> Because I haven't had a haircut in a year. Oh, I mean, shut up. No, she didn't say she hasn't shaved in a year. She just hasn't had a haircut in a year. I mean, we're, we're civilized here. We are civilized. I thought you said the West Coast of Florida. Well, yeah, they, we snuck over. We snuck over. Uh, God bless you, bro. Oh, man, you're, you're, you, are so funny. you are just, man, you lit my day up, man. All right. Thanks, Steve. And a little piece on the side, right?
Always, always, okay, always. Okay, brother. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Thank you, bye, man. Jackie. See you, Jackie. Bye, bye. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Oh, Jeez, oh man, ah, uh, that's a. <laughs> I think I laughed the whole show. Oh, I hope so because he is just what a what a gift. Man. Uh, I, oh, and Tom, man, thank you, bro. That was just so. We'll we'll look at we'll work it out. It doesn't have to be this Friday, but we'll work it out. We'll get you and Tom, uh, you Tom and Jackie, Jackie in the <laughs> same room, and uh, just watch ha what happens there. Uh, he is what a, oh, oh God. Man. I hope you guys had, had fun. I, I, for me, that was, I love comedy. Well, Gail says and, that her stomach hurts. Oh, man. <laughs> and that's the best sign. Uh, he is such a funny guy and such a, he's an extremely talented guy and a very, very and nice Lori person. Richardson's yeah. cheeks hurt. So oh, yeah, good. I think they thought it was funny. Good. Uh, don't say that in front of Jackie because he'll, <laughs> he'll have a comeback for you about yeah, your yeah, cheeks. Yeah, so yeah, just yeah. got to be careful. Dirty. He'll make it dirty. But he's gone now, so uh, your cheeks, <laughs> your cheeks are, are safe. safe. <laughs> you have safe cheeks. So, wow. That was just, oh. that was just incredible. Yeah. Well, that's our hour. Man, hour, hour, hour and 20 minutes. minutes. Wow. <laughs> oh, God. Now you know why Howard had, I mean, and let me tell you something I know about Jackie, which, I mean, the guy's, he's never off. You yeah. don't, he's it's not alive. like, well, oh, let me think of something. I mean, it's bang. Yeah. yeah very talented really guy. Yeah. And uh, very happy to have him on the show. So that's going to do it for us, guys. Okay, and tomorrow <clears> night uh, we have Tony Monaco, who right. is a piano player for the Turnstiles. Turnstiles currently, which is a Billy Joel, uh, another Billy Joel tribute band, right, and, and they do very well. And he was also in Thrills. We had another right. member of Thrills on the show, so that's tomorrow. And um, got a good one coming up Thursday, but I'm not going to tell you about that. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Man, you just, you're right. Without laughter, it's just not worth oh, being yeah. here. And uh, Did you man, talk about Thursday, I don't know. It's uh, David. David Prater. Yeah, I know, but I don't want to steal. Yeah. No, nobody's stealing. No one's stealing. Nobody's stealing. All right, you guys. I'm going to bounce. If I don't see you in the future, I'll see you in the past. I love you all. See you tomorrow. Be safe out there. Good night, everybody. Good night, kids.